Hello and uh, welcome to the Spinoza Sessions. I'm your host, Baruch Gottlieb, coming to you from Berlin and Grüningen and Westenhach, a contemporary art institution in The Hague, as part of our online series, Taustasin. Uh, Taustasin is uh, um, a program, a series uh, meant to maintain our commitment and uh, to engage the public with a stimulating cultural program, despite the fact that we are not permitted to entertain visitors and uh, give them access to our wonderful exhibitions, which are going on now, uh, including uh, Cesare Pietro Justi's uh, Variable Number of Things and uh, Mattia Denise's Theodore's Dream, as well as our um, uh, provocative project on emojis and the crisis of language, uh, written language, uh, moving towards the technical image, which is in our alphabetum, that's in our normal space, which is now closed, but uh, you can try to imagine it, or uh, with the aid of some information on our website, uh, westenhag.nl, where you can find uh, documentation of those projects. But in the meantime, we are doing this uh, series called Taustazine Every Day, uh, producing uh, uh, a new article, some kind of provocation, something interesting for uh, the people who normally come to visit us in our uh, space in the middle of The Hague at the former American Embassy. So this is a Taustasin 46, which means that uh, we're at least 46 days into the lockdown. And uh, however, according uh, to the latest pronouncements, uh, we will be able to reopen uh, the space again uh, on the 20th of May, let's see. Uh, probably it will be a different experience than uh, what we are used to uh, for us and for you, uh, the visitors who will be coming. So this is our third uh, session, and I'm very happy to uh, introduce to you a fairly relatively important figure, uh, one of the most important figures maybe in Dutch Spinoza scholarship today, Dr. Andrea San Giacomo. Andrea San Giacomo is the assistant professor uh, at the Faculty of Philosophy at uh, Grinnegan University. He's the principal investigator of the ERC starting grant project, The Normalization of Natural Philosophy, uh, former NWO Veni Laureate, and he's also coordinator of the Grinnegan Center uh, for Medieval and Early Modern Thought. Uh, he's de dedicated a lot of, a significant amount of his work to Spinoza, including his uh, multilingual edition in uh, Latin. Uh, Italian and uh, Dutch of uh, Spinoza's complete works, Tutti le opere, opere uh, and uh, he has two uh, recent monographs, including uh, L'essenza del corpo, Spinoza e la scienza della composizione, and Spinoza on reason, passions, and the supreme good, which I have seen, uh, which is coming forthcoming. Is it out yet? I have to yes, put um, you in. Okay, it says forthcoming on your bio. Let me let me bring you in here, Andrea. One moment. You are not visible, but now you are. Hello, welcome, Andrea. Hi. Thank you for joining us today on the uh, Hi. Spinoza sessions. Hi. So um, we want to talk about your new paper, uh, which is uh, very provocative and um, and should be fun to uh, discuss on uh, Spinoza's mistakes. Spinoza's mistake is only one, apparently. Um, but uh, maybe we will uh, we will see uh, how many mistakes there really are. Um, but before that, let's uh, talk a little bit about how you got interested in Spinoza and uh, what Spinoza uh, means to you today, especially maybe in this context. My entry point in, in Spinoza's studies, so that basically by translating um, uh, Spinoza, and especially the minor works by Spinoza. So I was mentioning before that uh, I spent some quite, quite quite some time in translating the letters and, and the correspondence, which I found very interesting because it gives also a kind of different perspective on Spinoza's philosophy because in his letters, Spinoza is basically getting in touch with people around him and, and talking about how his philosophy is developing. So, and, and that kind of approach, looking at the evolution of his thought, uh, remained a bit with me and over the years I think that I started being very much interested in his ontology and metaphysics and recently more recently I've been working more on his moral thought and, and, and ethical 
uh, ideas because I realized that actually these are the real things he really cared for and are the, the reason why he developed also his metaphysics uh, in the first place. So uh, this is more or less the main idea that is in the book that is, uh, came out for OUP in December last year. And uh, the idea of the book is that Spinoza's whole philosophy is, is aimed at developing uh, the, the tools, epistemological, metaphysical, ontological, in order to reach uh, supreme good, which is an ethical goal, and which is the reason why Spinoza did philosophy in the first place. So um, that also, I find it very fascinating because it, it shows really the connection between uh, his ethical existential concerns and his overall philosophical project. I don't know whether I said this before, but... Yeah, that was pretty good. Pretty good uh, reca re, uh, recapitulation. Recap. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, let's talk a little bit uh, more about that. So uh, these, um, these tools that he offers us to, uh, and this supreme good, I mean, how, how well are we doing so far in... Uh, <laughs> in Europe right now and in, in the world in general? Well, depends what people are doing in their homes at this point. So uh, according to Spinoza, I mean, the, the, the one, I mean, he changed his mind on many things and many topics. One thing he never changed mind about was the idea that the supreme good is the other with knowledge of God. And, and Spinoza's God, of course, is, is something peculiar in the way in which he defines it. And in, in the treatise on the mandation, he has a nice, uh, paraphrase for that, which is the knowledge of the union that the mind has with the whole of nature. And knowing that union, according to Spinoza, is reaching the supreme good. So whatever helps the mind to gain and develop that kind of knowledge uh, is definitely a means of approaching the supreme good. And and the interesting thing is that for Spinoza, uh, I mean, in, in, early in his career, he was m way more confident about the fact that the mind alone has already all the uh, tools that might be helpful and needed in order to develop that kind of knowledge. And basically, you just need to remove the external existential noise you have around you. So basically, you lock down in your, in your home, you just <laughs> meditate on, on the union that the mind has with the whole of nature, and that's it. And the later Spinoza becomes a bit more uh, skeptical about this, of this possibility and realizes that actually the external circumstances are necessary and certain kind of external circumstances are necessary in order for the mind to gain knowledge. So that's why the political thinking in Spinoza becomes much more prominent. And I would say, to put it a bit more provocatively, that it, in his last years, he would think that the solution to how to reach the supreme good becomes a political solution and no longer just an epistemic or metaphysical solution. So how are we doing? Well, it depends what we're doing. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, as you said, like in a way he's opening up to the inadequate, uh, uh, inadequate knowledge that we're getting from a uh, so-called first form of knowledge and seeing that as a kind of a necessary uh, input towards so not so, something that that is just noise and we have to extract from our experience in order to mm. to uh, to come closer to the supreme good but uh, yeah I mean uh, interesting thing is that on the one hand Spinoza will keep the point that imagination is a source of errors and and it does not want to negotiate that per se but he realizes that adequate and inadequate ideas are not apple and pears that just go on, on completely different tracks, but they are very much intermingled. And, and hence, in every interaction we have with external causes, there is always some degree of adequate knowledge, and there is also always some degree of inadequate knowledge. And, and that changes, so it's, it's like mixing up different ingredients. And the mixture is what makes the result going in a way or another. So basically, you can always build upon that even minimal degree of adequacy you have in any kind of interaction you entertain with others. And building on that will foster reason and adequate knowledge. So you don't have 
to necessarily give up any kind of uh, imagination because imagination is always intermingled with some kind of adequate understanding of things. And of course, the ratio between imagination and reason is what becomes really, really important. And sometimes some kind of imagination might be helpful exactly to foster that rational component. And it works like a catalyst for, for fostering that rational component. So it's, it's very difficult. And that's also why Spinoza becomes much more interested in the later uh, works, and especially in the political treaties, to the particular social political circumstances in which individuals operate. And each different circumstance has different uh, strategies that become possible in that, in that condition to foster this higher uh, form of uh, integration between imagination and reason. But still with the idea that, I mean, it's reason the thing you want to develop. So I, I think this point remains clear for Spinoza. It, what changes is, is the strategy that you could use to do that. So uh, always the uh, objective is the supreme good. Um, yeah. And so how, let's go to uh, the paper that you, uh, that we were, uh, that you're working on right now, this, this uh, paper on, on Spinoza's mistake, uh, which is uh, concerned with achieving eternal joy or the, the yes. search or the quest for eternal joy in Spinoza. Yes. Uh, how is this eternal joy connected to the supreme good? Well, yes. So uh, basically that paper uh, at, at the beginning was just the idea for a blog post. And then when I start, started writing it, it, it was longer and longer and longer. So I realized now it's not going to be a fit blog post. And the idea is that after, uh, I mean, 13 years of reading Spinoza, I realized that I never kind of challenged or, or questioned the thing he never challenged or questioned. What I just said, the, the supreme good is the uh, um, idea of God. And at the very beginning of the, of the treatise on the mandation of the intellect, this becomes already clear. And Spinoza explains the reason why he wants to devote himself to philosophy. And the reason is because he's seeking a kind of joy that can provide the mind with a form of eternal enjoyment. So a joy that is not doomed to fade away after a while, but a joy that can remain with the mind forever. And of course, the reasoning is seemingly straightforward since God is an eternal object. If you enjoy that eternal object, also the enjoyment should be eternal, which sounds, may sound quite reasonable. And someone may just question whether it's possible to know that eternal object. And, and that's exactly what Spinoza is going to deepen. So uh, basically the supreme good is the knowledge of God because the mind will enjoy that forever and hence will not experience any drawback of more worldly joy, joys like that are doomed to, to fade away. So, and, and since for Spinoza, good and bad are always relative terms, even the supreme good can be considered to be supreme only relatively to something. And this something is the mind. So the only reason why the knowledge of God is the supreme good is because the mind can enjoy it forever without any shortcomings connected with that experience. So even the supreme good, even the idea of God is subjected to the, let's say, existential or subjective experience that, that one can have. Right. Well, um... So, but as you mentioned, and this is part of your argument, I think there, that uh, um, once uh, one reaches this adequate knowledge of the supreme good, uh, this is not a static uh, experience, that it doesn't yeah. don't just stay there, right? Uh, yes. It's in a suspended joy. And that's, that's something that you are examining in this article, uh, I think, uh, that, that, that has to do with uh, a contradiction there that you aspire yeah. to that, but uh, that once, uh, but that is, first of all, of course, since we are finite beings, we cannot un categorically cannot understand this infinite being, or we cannot have adequate knowledge of this infinite being, or, uh, or maybe we, but also there, of course, 
through the mind, which is itself infinite. There's also that stream in Spinoza where there is something that transcends our mortal existence. That's the part that we are always in contact constantly. So we don't need to do anything because we're already always in there. Yeah. So the, the, the argument I, I tried to make in this piece that at some point will be published uh, in, in a kind of controversy section of the journal In Circolo, which is uh, based in Milan in this December. So I'm, I'm collecting some reactions against the paper and, and then that will be uh, published in December. So I may send the link for those who are interested. But the main argument is that Spinoza is seeking an eternal joy and he thinks that if the object of joy is eternal, then joy as the affect it will be eternal. Now, he makes a good argument. In, in, in the treatise on the emendation, that's stated fairly straightforwardly, and Spinoza doesn't have yet all the conceptual machinery that he will develop in the ethics. Now, if we look for a while at, at the ethics, of course, this is the familiar claim about the intellectual love of God that arises in the, third, in the fifth part of the ethics and works exactly in that way. And of course, Spinoza acknowledged that uh, this intellectual love is even not really a love because it's not uh, due to a, a transition to a higher degree of power, but just the enjoyment of the supreme degree of power. Now, according to Spinoza, from an ecological point of view, of course, the mind does have an adequate knowledge of the essence of God. And this is a very controversial claim that Spinoza makes in the second part of the ethics, but I'm not questioning that. So I grant to Spinoza that, of course, the mind can know adequately the essence of God. And the essence of God is just there is a being that is eternal and infinite. And that's it. And you know that by knowing extension of thoughts. And that's fine. And I also grant to Spinoza that when the mind con contemplates this idea, of course, the power of thinking of the mind increases because it, it reaches basically the foundation of all reality and hence uh, it, it experiences a transition. It experiences a love toward the object that makes that transition possible. Hence, intellectual love of God as such is possible. Now, the, the, the jump that Spinoza makes, even in the ethics, is that since this idea is eternal, because it's the idea of the essence of God that cannot change. And since the intellectual love of God is possible, because the mind can know it and can enjoy this knowledge, then the intellectual love of God itself is eternal, and one can enjoy it forever. And that's exactly what makes it uh, so, so sweet, so, so worth pursuing. And, and that's exactly the problem, because, of course, Spinoza knows very well Two things that all effects, all affects, including joy and love, are transitions, right? So they are forms of becoming. So and these are excluded in, in under the species of eternity. And more importantly, Spinoza knows that the mind can know itself or other things only via affections. Now, if the actual enjoyment of the intellectual love of God is just the degree of power that the mind has in itself. So there is no affection. And if there is no affection, there cannot be any way in which the mind knows that degree, right? So Spinoza had a very good reason to think that affects result from transitions of power. And this is the, the, cor I mean, the, the, the cornerstone of the whole third and fourth part of the ethics. And now at, at the end, when he needs to describe the supreme good, he seems to forget that. And, and think, no, no, but if the, if the object is eternal, the affect connected with that would be eternal as well, because that's so nice and so desirable, that must be true. But of course, if something is desirable, that does not make it true, right? That's, that's the obvious trick. And, and what I find interesting in the uh, Treatise on Emendation, I was spending some time recently uh, reading the very, very first paragraphs again, again, uh, is that in those passages, you don't have all this complex conceptual machinery you find in the ethics later on, but you just have Spinoza as an individual guy, uh, 25 old years old, more or less, deciding to give up 
uh, his, his previous uh, life and devoting himself to philosophy and wanting to do that basically because he is dissatisfied with the life he was living before. And the main dissatisfaction is that all kinds of affects you can experience in life are doomed to fade away, even the, the best ones. And that's exactly the dissatisfaction. The dissatisfaction is the impermanence of all affects. And hence, he strives for an eternal uh, enjoyment. And this is the reason for doing philosophy, because this is achievable via knowledge. But the problem is whether this is possible in the first place, right? And, and he ends up saying that, of course, this is the thing that is most desirable. And, but the fact that something is desirable does not entail that something is real. So the, there's the question of the possibility and there's the qu question of the congruity in Spinoza's yeah. argumentation. Yeah. Right, because uh, you have um, okay, maybe the ideal state would be a adequate, or uh, um, you know, you, this achieving this this joyful state. But this joyful state is uh, also, I mean, again, I have a hard time to imagine or, or a hard time to understand how this can be a static state that it does not fluctuate, or there's no oscillations. A uh, very very various ability to be in this state of joy so yeah no right that's exactly the problem so in in the very first lines of the treatise on demandation he describes this eternal joy as eternal and continuous and so the idea of continuity it's exactly what he strives for because i think what is interesting here is not just saying that spinoza made a mistake and that's maybe relevant it's it's seeing why he's making that mistake and, and what's behind it. And what I find quite fascinating is, is seeing what Spinoza is escaping from. And I think this is a bit overlooked, especially, I mean, I've been overlooking it for a lot of time because today, of course, we evaluate a lot Spinoza's theory of affects and, and his uh, way of analyzing desire and emotions and the third and fourth part of the ethics are very prominent today in Spinoza scholarship. So, uh, and that's of course very interesting. And as you said, that part of Spinoza's thought is a very clear explanation of why the all of our emotional life is a, a form of perpetual becoming, a form of perpetual flux and transitions of power going up or down. And sometimes when you develop knowledge, they tend to go up and sometimes they will go down inevitably because external causes will always be stronger than us. I mean, we're locked down in our homes. This is quite straightforward example of external causes being stronger. So, um, right, that, that, that can happen. But um, what we might tend to forget is that Spinoza has never been content with just analyzing affects and just telling their nature or, or telling them apart or this is a bit better, this is a bit worse. No, the all analysis of the affects is aimed at achieving that supreme enjoyment that is not a form of becoming, right? That's the whole point. That's the, the reason why he was doing philosophy and that's the reason why he stick to philosophy for his whole life. So this can't, I mean, can be missed because of course the ethics is so complicated and, and there are so many themes and, and our interests are also a bit far to, uh, today from this ideal of an eternal and supreme enjoyment of, of knowledge. It's not a very common kind of goal you would set for yourself. Uh, but nonetheless, that was Spinoza's goal. And I think, first of all, we need to take that at face value and, and take that seriously and then challenge whether that's even possible on Spinoza's own uh, grounds. So, and, and I think that the mistakes is, is, is a mistake exactly because Spinoza himself, in a sense, demonstrates that that's not possible. But nonetheless, stick to that for your whole life because it was so nice to desire it. And, and that's also the problem, that he doesn't see that the whole thing is driven by this desire, which he never questioned. And actually, he'll make it into the essence of human beings, right? It will say that cupiditas est omnipotentia, so the, 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 the desire, appetite, 
whatever you want to call it, is the essence of human beings. So you, that would be a theorem in the ethics. And, and for us, that sounds appealing. But in the context of Spinoza's philosophy, that's not what the, the goal of the system is. That's the problem that he wants to escape from. That's the reason why he started writing the system down in order to find an escape from that. And so we should take that into account, I think. So let's, let's bring it back to something you were mentioning at the beginning there, um, that of, of the Spinoza's political project and see how this fits mm. in. Because as you say, he's uh, escaping from impermanence. He's, uh, he wants uh, towards something that is or some, it's escaping from uh, Vergänglichkeit, they say in German, it's uh, yeah, ephemeral, that, they just, uh, that things mm. do not last, to striving towards some uh, um, ideal state, um, it, something that will not, that will endure. And of course, as we, as you were just discussing, it's a kind of asymptotic curve, right? You get, you get closer and closer, but maybe we never reach it, but it's actually like the, uh, and and of course, I think Spinoza also is 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 quite conscious that it's going to take a lot of effort to get there. And maybe it's yeah. it's that it's just having that objective there uh, is more important than actually uh, that than the possibility of ever achieving it. You maybe get a taste of it from time to time, uh, or you can, yeah yeah maybe yeah no definitely the political yeah I mean. Is, to allow us to taste it more often or as much as possible or something like that. Yeah, no, no, sure. I mean, if you look at the fifth part of the ethics, of course, he mentions that achieving the attitude is very difficult. So only very few people can do that. And uh, he's aware that, that the task might be very daunting and very difficult. And in, in the political treatise, surprisingly, now I'm thinking about that, um, he mentions something very similar. So the goal of the political treatise is to find constitutions that may allow a state to remain unchanged. And, and the goal of the constitutions that he envisages in the political treatise are all aimed at eternity. And of course, this is under, I mean, with, with a huge qualification that human affairs, of course, are very changeable. And, and so constitution will remain unchanged unless uh, external causes will prevent that. So, of course, Spinoza is aware that even a perfectly organized state can be just destroyed by any kind of external circumstances in which people don't have any power. And I think this is pretty clear, as I was mentioning to us as well. So, but even in the political writings, there is this kind of echo of an ideal of eternity, even in the political domain. And this idea is translated into the moral, social, political ideal of, of security and stability, political stability. And of course, in the political context, it is a more dynamic kind of equilibrium between different affects that nonetheless allow citizens to remain also in equilibrium among themselves. But this nonetheless, as I was saying, I mean, I think that the point uh, that I find most fascinating here is not really whether for us something is achievable or not, but trying to understand what Spinoza really wanted to do with his own system. Because, I mean, if he didn't uh, achieve that himself, so, I mean, why are we reading the ethics, right? So, uh, I mean, he, he invented that. So he, he must be uh, the one, if anybody can, can get there, he must be one of those because he wrote the, the book down. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, taking that seriously then, so I think it's important to reflect on why is Spinoza writing this? So is, is he writing this because he kind of is happy with, with this kind of ideal of a limit you can strive for forever and get a taste of that here and then uh, sometimes? Well, I don't think so. I think he's way more ambitious than that. So he really wants to get the thing. He really wants to get eternity. And, and it's pretty clear. And of course, this is also maybe uneasy for us because today people are uneasy with the idea of fraternity of course they don't find that very much connected with their own lives and and hence they they might want to find alternatives and this is entirely fine of course i mean we can select what to read in the ethics and and extract from there what we think it's more helpful for us that's entirely fine what i've been fascinating fascinated with uh, recently is 
small trying to understand the young Spinoza, trying to decide to change completely his life, because this is what he describes, a complete radical change in his life, and for doing what, and, and whether that decision was entirely sound, or whether there was still something affecting his way of seeing things. So in, in short, I think that, yeah, eternity might be downgraded, might be put on, on the corner, if you like, it's not super trendy today, but that was Spinoza's thing. So he, he was really up for that. And the problem is that he, he was not allowed because his own system would prevent him. <laughs> Well, also, I think people, another thing that people today maybe do not uh, easily comprehend is that there is this kind of scope of time uh, where Spinoza is, is thinking, and lots of, all, most philosophers at that time were, were thinking in epochal lengths of time. So if we were to try to achieve some of the things that, that Spinoza is proposing in, in the, for, for example, in the, te in the teepee, we have a sense that he, he doesn't really think that we're ready for democracy, but maybe we will be in 300 years, 500 years, you know, mm. we have some time, but we don't have that sense of you know, time expanding in, infinitely. We can count on it now. So that leads us to distrust these notions of eternity. I think. Yeah. Although, I mean, for Spinoza, eternity is not really like some, something that takes up, a, a very long duration. It's completely, it's somehow overlapping with duration. It's just the same thing seen from a different perspective. And basically the perspective of eternity is the perspective of necessity. So when you see everything as absolutely necessary, then of course you see that as eternal because everything that happens, happens exactly the way in which it should have happened and it could not be different. And no matter what you do, that's exactly what should be happening. And so that's, Spinoza's understanding of eternity, it's, it's really necessity, basically. And that being said, what you say is also interesting, that there is not much idea of, of teleological development in history for Spinoza. It's more like a state of nature at all levels, the state of nature, the political sense. So both individuals and states and organizations of all kinds, struggles and bumps into each other and, and change all the time. And this is Spinoza's nature. So it's, it's not a well-ordered Aristotelian universe. It's more like a kind of chaotic clash of different strivings, right? And, and sometimes some strivings are more successful, sometimes they're less successful, but in the end of the day, they're all going to be unsuccessful because they're all going to be destroyed by something stronger. So, and that's the, the sad news you find in, at the beginning of the fourth part of the ethics, right? that no matter how strong you are, at some point there will be someone stronger. So that's, that's it. And that's why it's important for Spinoza to, to find an escape from that, right? And it's very good if you can land in, in, in a condition that is relatively permanent for the time being, because this will allow you to get to that point where then you're safe. So there is a very nice line in Lucretius, I think it's the beginning of the second book of the Rerum Natura, where he uh, basically describes how sweet it is to see someone uh, like a shipwreck. And then you're watching that safe from, from the, the shore. And you know that you're not in danger because you're, you've built your, your life on the uh, doctrine of, of the wise, as Lucretius says. It's a very, very uh, nice uh, piece of poetry. And it, it sounds a bit harsh to us because, okay, you're seeing someone in danger and you think you're, all, you're safe. This doesn't sound very good. But actually what Lucretius wants to say is that uh, this ideal of the wise, the sage, that through knowledge recognizes all the dangers he is free from and has built a kind of refuge where he, can, he or she can, can rest. Uh, that's a very old image, very old kind of uh, ideal. And I think Spinoza is completely uh, bound with that ideal. And this does not mean that, of course, political circumstances are not important. On the contrary, they are quite important, they are necessary, but yet they are not the goal. They are means, they are instruments. They have an instrumental value, they are not 
that the goal is not to build the perfect state because even the perfect state will be uh, trashed away at some point. So the goal is to live in the perfect state as much as possible because that will lead you to escape from the need of any other means, right? And that's also the kind of ultimate goal that Spinoza sets for himself. And, and I mean, we can recognize that the bar is extremely high at this point, but this is also the challenge of, of Spinoza's philosophy. So that's also why the fifth part is the most important part of the ethics, although it's, it's the most difficult and also the most controversial. Great. Well, I think we're going to uh, open it up for uh, uh, people's questions in a moment. I, I w just to go back to the young Spinoza, to uh, yeah. you know, which you are uh, uh, concerned with these days, and of course you also mentioned uh, before we started that uh, uh, Spinoza survived the plague. Right? Uh, there was a, yeah. the plague was going through uh, the Netherlands or the Dutch Republic yeah. at that time. Although he de doesn't write about it. Uh, no, not really. Yeah. But another thing he might, uh, now this is my provocative and very maybe uh, silly uh, question to you, but, uh, um, you know, as you mentioned in the emendations and uh, in his early writings, he's, he's very clearly trying to uh, find this eternal uh, something that he can rely on. Uh, and of course, what occurs to me, and, and he uses often the, the word love, um, this uh, uh, this uh, intellectual love of God it becomes intellectual love of God but and uh, and this is like an eternal love and this eternal love is supposed to replace an uh, um, a mortal love and of course there's this I don't know if it's true maybe you know more about this than uh, I do but uh, apparently he was uh, he had a true love uh, a real uh, what do you call it mortal love to a person. Who he was not able to consummate, and he was very, very hurt by this, this failure. And I'm wondering yeah. if, if, if there's somehow uh, playing in at the beginning of this whole philosophical quest, this search for some love that is that won't let him down. <laughs> that, and and uh, just if you can go into that 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 question, that use of the word love, too, there a little bit at that time. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll read a tiny bit from the treatise on, on the emendation. So after Spinoza has discussed the three main goods that common people mostly seek, which are sensual pleasures and honors and wealth, he has his own reasoning on why these are problematic and, and unsatisfactory. And then uh, he, he writes, these evils, which are these goods, uh, seem to have arisen from the fact that all happiness or unhappiness was placed in the quality of the object to which we uh, cling with love. For strife will never arise on account of what is not loved, nor will there be sadness if it perishes, nor envy if it is possessed by another, nor fear, nor hatred. In a word, no disturbances of the mind. Indeed, all these happen only in the love of those things that can perish, and all the things we have just spoken of can do. But love toward an eternal and infinite thing feeds the mind with a joy eternally exempt from sadness. This is greatly to be desired and to be soft with all our strength. So uh, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on philosophical gossip. So uh, I, we don't have actually much information about his, his private life. It, I mean, it's understandable that the young Spinoza might have a, had an affair at some point, and it's understandable that the affair didn't work. I mean, most of the time they don't work. So, so uh, that wouldn't be a surprise. But what I find interesting is, if, even if this was the inspiration, uh, it's how he distilled that and what he distilled from that. And what I just read is very interesting because there, Spinoza does see that the problem with all the things he describes is not actually the object, is the emotional involvement with the object. It's, it's pretty clear. It's saying, if, if you don't love something, you don't care what happened to that. Even if it's impermanent, it's not your problem. I mean, it's like, do we care for what happens on, on, on Mars? If there is a huge storm on Mars and, and everything got destroyed on Mars, do we care? No. Why? Because we don't have any emotional connection with what happens on Mars, right? But if it happens in our garden, of course, we do care because we do have an 
an emotional connection. So having realized this, Spinoza d- does not make the further step saying, okay, then maybe the problem is the emotional connection. No, he makes the other easier step. No, okay, the problem is the object with which you have the emotional connection. And yes, if you replace the object, you might be better served. But the problem was exactly how you relate with the object. So uh, th- that, that's the kind of things he, he, he can't see. And it's in front of him. He's even saying it. I, I find that very, very funny. So uh, I, I'm very fascinated with this. Are you willing to entertain a comment? Is that possible? Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let, sure. please, please. Okay, so uh, Andrea, I've always been struck by how close the opening paragraphs of the treatise on the emendation of the intellect sound to Augustine. And yeah. there is a kind of strain of thought that also, that is in a sense remobilized in uh, the pietist movements, including movements that had some impact on the, uh, on the collegians, as collegiate interlocutors. And so I've always thought that that uh, particular passage was one more way in which um, he echoes these very Augustinian themes. Now, I don't think that uh, changes your larger point at all. I think it's a a very interesting point. In fact, um, that is the thing that you're calling Spinoza's mistake, as far as I can tell. Um, But you might switch the focus to to tragedy. What he failed to do was to find a way to extirpate tragedy from the human experience. and that would, of course, include the loss of, of loves, which he seems to want to embrace as, as good loves. I think it's interesting to me that he seems to be caught in this kind of struggle that possibly also enveloped Aristotle. Um, you want to think of good still in a kind of platonic way, where you're expo- where you're protected from the possibility of tragedy, tragic conflict and loss. Um, But you also, uh, and I think this is pretty clear in the political treatise, um, um, you realize that whatever good humans can enjoy is going to be in part or even wholly dependent upon the connection with other human beings and embracing the goods that are part of um, uh, the communal life the life of an actual human community and the goods that are available in within its context. So um, I don't know, is this a clash between original uh, religious values that might have been shaping him earlier in his life and what may be a kind of um, Epicureanism, if we're to believe Dimitri Vardilakis, for example, I think you're right to, I was very taken by your citing Lucretius here. Um, so now I think I'm, I guess I'm fishing around for a kind of diagnosis of the mistake. Well, no, that's thanks, the Mark. end of my comment. Yeah. Apologize yeah. for going on so long. No, thanks much, Keith. Nice to hear you. Uh, so, uh, I completely agree. And, and thanks indeed. I do think that, that the religious background is, is very much, uh, I mean, relevant here. And, and I mean, might also be uh, not just Augustine, but uh, like even in the, in the Bible, you find references to how impermanent and unsatisfactory all worldly things are, right? And this is usually one of the uh, arguments you find in, in kind of religious context to, I mean, turn away from the world and look at God. So in that, in that sense, um, Spinoza's move is, is not something unheard before or completely uh, new and unseen, so far from this. Uh, um, and, and again, you can bring in different kinds of traditions and different kinds of sources. And of course, these are all sources that are very, very well, well rooted in, in our uh, culture and tradition and maybe today are a bit more uh, on, on the side, on the corner, because less appealing because they don't fit much with contemporary values. But um, the interesting thing is that Spinoza gives its own spin to, to this. And 
this has to do with this reflection on the nature of desire. And in the, show, in the treatise on the mandation, there is no development of this theme. Indeed, love, desire, hatred, sadness, they're all give, taken for granted. So there is no definition of what they are. And Spinoza just assumes that the reader is familiar with these affects. But uh, of course, in the ethics, you provide the whole theory about what's the nature of them, right? So okay. it does not just take them for granted. So in a sense, that will become the original contribution of Spinoza, not, not just aiming at the supreme eternal good that you can enjoy forever, which is basically, I mean, what all religious traditions in the West have been trying to develop and not just in the West. Uh, but then it will provide this strong theoretical background about affects. The problem is that the, the theoretical background shows that that goal is impossible. That's, that's the irony. That's what I find really beautiful and, and funny and crazy in Spinoza. That the, the, the most original contribution of his theory is just undermining what he wants to achieve. And he should have realized that, especially well, because actually, it's written in geometrical order. Well, I, I actually agree with you. In fact, um, um, and I think maybe there's some indication in political treatise that he recognized it, but that's yeah. my reading of it. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. And in the political writings, this becomes very clear because of course he's dealing with politics and, and again, he's conversant with Aristotle, he's conversant with the old tradition before, and he still strives for this kind of eternal constitution that will ensure safety and some degree of, I mean, um, constancy to the political organization, but nonetheless, he acknowledges that, okay, this is of course, we're dealing with, with human beings and, and everything is changing within nature. So it's, it's interesting to see how it's torn, but I think that the interesting thing, if you wanna analyze Spinoza as a person behind his philosophy, is his stubbornness with the idea that despite all his theorems and all his demonstrations, still, enjoying something eternal, of course, go for it, always. I mean, well, it's, it's completely uh, crazy. Uh, I think we have maybe so, but I, I'm inclined to think uh, that Sorry, by I, the time he I, got I, to the political treatise, uh, he yeah. thought that the best he could get was something like peace. There's some very interesting language mm. in the political treatise about peace as a virtue, which I've yeah, never right. seen discussed. Right. Right, right. So uh, interesting because political treatise does also summary of the ethics and in, in his way of summarizing the ethics in the political treatise, Spinoza even discussed free will, which if you read the ethics, you know that there is little free will in the ethics. So it's a bit puzzling what the late, late Spinoza yeah. would say about this. But unfortunately or fortunately, he died before finishing the thing. So we don't know much more. And of course, he might have changed his mind at some point. Although I think political treatise is just a way of adjusting for the political settings what is adjustable from the ethics. So he, for himself, he would stick to the ethics. That's my, my, my sense, at least, uh, the, the sense I got from, from the character. Uh, I think okay, we'll thanks. go for about 10 more. Thank, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, I think we'll go for 10 more minutes. If anybody else uh, would, is that okay with you, Andrea? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, anybody else have some thoughts or some uh, questions for Andrea? Uh, you have a question from uh, one student from your seminar. What was the inspiration for this, to do this workshop? <laughs> was there any Spinozist motivation or connection uh, to, do, <laughs> to do this workshop right now? I don't know. Uh, which workshop you mean? I guess this is a workshop now. Uh, oh, this, this one? Yeah, yeah this, this talk now. Well, Baruch, you invited yeah. me. Yeah, so exactly. usually I say yes to invitations about Spinoza stuff. <laughs> I shouldn't say that publicly because now... <laughs> now it's well known. So I, I didn't see any good reason not to do that. So yeah. abiding to the principle of sufficient reason. Yeah. Uh, so Maybe uh, uh, this is a, another occasion for us to 
uh, ask you about some Spinoza's reflections on our current uh, condition now, uh, seeing as we were getting to the, uh, the political treaties. Oh, okay. Uh, the Anapasari oh, uh, workshop. Anapanasati. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, so this is some, oh, okay. Um, so, okay. That was something very different, unrelated to Spinoza. Yeah, and, that's the, uh, you, you quote it at the beginning of your paper here. No, you don't. Okay, that's something else. No, so, okay, if you want me to go into this, yes, so I can disclose. So the, the, yeah. the key uh, of, of the reading I'm, I'm suggesting here is a kind of Buddhist reading, mm -hmm. and it's kind of put impression on Spinoza from a Buddhist perspective, because uh, over the last semesters, I organized two seminars in Groningen on the early discourses of Buddha, so uh, the suttas, and we've been reading some of them and, and discuss some of the topics. And of course, one recurrent topic there is the notion of desire and the problems connected with that. And one uh, often mentioned scheme that is used in the discourses is the scheme of uh, gratification, danger, and escape that is applied to uh, analyze different phenomena, including central pressures. And uh, when I was reading again the treatise on the mandation, I realized that Spinoza was going almost through the same scheme. So I started digging with that scheme, using that scheme, gratification, danger, and escape, to analyze Spinoza's uh, motivations for doing philosophy. And I found that it works quite well, except that Spinoza doesn't make the move of challenging desire it's, itself, as we were discussing before. So, and it's also interesting because, uh, I mean, reading Spinoza now with also sometimes keeping in mind what happened in other countries' context, I, I'm thinking about ancient Buddhism in ancient India, um, you do realize that he was drawing on a certain kind of meditation tradition. He used the terms med meditation. And actually what he's doing in the treatise on lamentation, it's quite a good example of what meditation might look like. So, but of course, it would go in a very different direction. So I think it's also interesting to uh, kind of uncover this, uh, this potential that the text has and that we might tend to forget because we, we wouldn't, otherwise focus on that. Uh, I don't know what this answers completely mm -hmm. the question. For people who uh, uh, are interested, we also looked at in the first uh, session of this series uh, with uh, Mateus Janik from, from University of Warsaw, mm -hmm. uh, the influence of uh, Neo-Confucianism and uh, Confucian ideas that were going through Europe at the time and whether yeah. uh, it was possible that uh, Spinoza was uh, I, honestly, I have to admit that I have only very inadequate ideas about this, so I, I can't really comment. Uh, I mean, my sense is that there is a common background, even at the level of experience, uh, in which you go through certain existential challenges anyway. So, I mean, what, what all philosophers share is that they are dead or they're going to die. Sorry, I mean, <laughs> this is pretty obvious. So it's something that all philosophers have to, to face at some point in their own life. So it's, I mean, it's there. It's a problem on the table if you want it or not. And indeed Spinoza does reflect on that. And, and he, he will have a theorem about that, right? The free man uh, does not meditate on death. He, does, he, he meditates on, on life. So he does have a reflection on, yeah. on this. And, and this is a kind of common background that allows to draw then also comparisons about how different traditions in different parts of the world have gone about the same kind of existential challenges that just human beings face because they're human beings. So, and this is a kind of very, very common background that would fit Spinoza's philosophy because this is exactly what the common notion is supposed to be. So this is the basis of reason. So if you want to start reasoning, you should start from the things that everybody shares. And the fact of being liable to that is one of them. And the fact that everything is going to change is another one. I mean, you don't need to be a Buddhist to make this uh, observation. But of course, different traditions in different times and different contexts would develop that uh, reflection in a very different way. 
And so it, that becomes also very interesting to see these differences and uh, uh, kind of uncover why people go in different ways and what's behind it. Yeah, and as we, we were mentioning just before, as, as he got older, he, he moved from the, from the pure meditations, from some kind of ascetic practice to a much more committed political practice, which has a lot more room for, for heterogeneity. Yes, uh, I mean, I don't know whether he personally uh, moved much because mm -hmm. uh, Spinoza as the guy didn't move much, <laughs> but uh, he basically did his whole life almost always in the same way. So he didn't change his style or didn't become a politician or, or even didn't want to teach at university. So that was not his thing. So, but he, he did realize that maybe he could even enjoy that kind of life because he happened to live in a country that at the time was relatively free and relatively flexible about what people could do or, or what people could think and even what people could say. Even if, I mean, of course, Spinoza didn't have an easy life in that respect, but nonetheless, he was enjoying some greater degree of freedom compared with other countries at the time. So he might have, I think he, he will, he, he realized at some point that that environment is very important and is ne even necessary and hence should be protected. And he did his best to, to do that. But I mean, the, the, there is this uh, letter and maybe this might be a way of also um, kind of finding a, a close to this, but there is this uh, letter uh, 32 in which uh, at the end of it, basically Spinoza uh, gives some information uh, about the, um, the war, the Anglo uh, Dutch war that is going on at the time. So, um, whether I can find the passage. Uh, so, So basically, and now uh, I'm not sure I can find the passage immediately, but um, basically he mentioned this, like if people want to kill each other, let them do whatever they want. Unless, I mean, it, it, as long as I can do my own thing and, and devote myself to philosophy, <laughs> that's enough for me. So. Uh, you know, of course, if you can make a contribution and, and make the state where you live a bit better or defend what's good in it, that's go for it. But Spinoza, as Baruch Spinoza, as, as a person, as an individual, won't uh, necessarily uh, become an activist for peace or something like that. So that's also why. But because he, he thought that actually that was not the main, main goal, was not the supreme good in itself was just instrumental so and that's also the reason of his motto caute so be cautious so that's i think adds to the complexity because otherwise we, we think spinoza is a kind of hero for of democracy or or activism of some sort and of course he can inspire that and that's fine and, and good but he himself was also kind of shy guy that was living in his small room and, and just polishing concepts and lenses mm -hmm. and he liked that well, yeah, I think that uh, we can see that there is that that's tension in in all of us who dedicate ourselves to to thinking intensively about things that uh, uh, we want to provide some some guidance for not only for people who are alive, alive now, but maybe and that's maybe some one part of the conceit of writing that we are providing some help for for the future as well, that we are yeah. contributing to a, a longer project that there's something maybe we're getting close to this notion of eternity. <laughs> Could we even imagine that human beings will be eternal, which seems uh, less and less uh, uh, likely, um, uh, a li a likely uh, uh, expectation, uh, but that, yeah, we write uh, and, and Spinoza certainly wrote, I mean, he wrote for humans. I mean, uh, you, you don't write for plants or, or even for God, because God knows it all already. So uh, you just, uh, he, he wrote, and the ethics is really a kind of, an, and, and the TTP and TP, 
are really instruction manual, kind of uh, secular instruction manuals on how to uh, generate, uh, from, from my point of view, how to generate the best conditions for, for human uh, commonwealth, is the word he used yeah. from, from, uh, from uh, Hobbes. Um, and, but that's, that's an ongoing project and uh, we need a bunch of principles maybe figuring out those principles those are uh, eternal <laughs> eternality which can uh, can transcend uh, 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 all the travails that uh, happen politically at any particular time and that maybe uh, in some way uh, uh, that's the trade-off that you have to make as a thinker that's possible and for spinoza we are already eternal that's the point of eternity you don't need to get it otherwise what's the point if, if you're not eternal already, yeah. you can't become eternal at some point. So, uh, yes, the mind is already eternal. There is already an eternal idea of you in God and all that stuff has to be there already. That's also the, the I mean, in a sense, the, the nice thing because you cannot get to eternity, right? It will take eternity to get to eternity. So I, either it's already there or it's not there. And if it's already there, it's only a matter of knowing it. That's why knowledge is so important for Spinoza. That's why intuitive science is so important because it, it gives you a perspective on, on the exact same reality you have in front of you, but from a completely different point of view, which is no longer the point of view of duration, no longer the point of view of imagination, but the point of view of the essence of that same reality. And the essence of that same reality is the fact of being eternal and infinite, namely necessary. So maybe the bridge, if you want to find the bridge between practical attitudes and more speculative attitudes, is really in this idea of necessity, which plays both the practical and metaphysical role. Because from the metaphysical point of view, necessity is the key to understand Spinoza's notion of God, eternity, and is all metaphysics, basically. It's a metaphysics of necessity. But from the practical point of view, Spinoza would recommend that seeing things as necessary is exactly what gets you through the passions, what, what gets you to improve your power, because it allows you to uh, dismiss the unhelpful kind of effects you may have, the unhelpful prejudices you may have, and reach some degree of contentment, which is essential for the mind to thrive. So uh, seeing things as necessary is a way of kind of cutting through the clouds of uh, inadequate knowledge and make the best of what you have. So in, in that sense, it's maybe the real bridge between practical and metaphysical domains of Spinoza's philosophy is really this idea of necessity. And, and this is something that might be helpful even, even today, because uh, when you really realize that something is necessary, it couldn't be otherwise, you just stop struggling. Because if you really understand that something is impossible or has to be in a certain way, then it, it doesn't make sense to struggle. I mean, you don't struggle against the law of gravity, right? You don't try to fly in your room all the time. Why? Because you know you can't. So what's the point of trying to jump and trying to fly? So you don't do it. And if you can see all the other things with the same degree uh, of, of insight, then probably all, not all, but many of our current uh, kind of mental uh, disturbances, to use an euphemism, uh, may fade away a bit. So in that sense, that might be a Spinoza advice to us. Thinks about things as if they are necessary. Because they are. <laughs> That's the point. But, so whether they are uh, happy necessities or sad necessities, uh, we uh, sadly uh, uh, have the necessity to finish this, uh, <laughs> this uh, conversation at one point, and uh, that point uh, will be now. So... Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'd thanks like for to having thank, me. Thank, thanks to everybody who uh, was patient with us. Thank, sorry for the uh, technical dis, uh, disruptions, the struggle, the unnecessary struggle. We tried to make it as smooth as possible. And thanks for bearing with us. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Uh, we did record the conversation, so we will be putting it back up on on the the Best in Hag website, so you'll be able to refer to that uh, again. But uh, since it was not on YouTube, it'll take a little bit of uh, time to post produce. Um, Andrea, okay. you're also um, uh, doing a summer summer camp um, or summer school of Spinoza, which is not happening this year, but next year. 
Uh, yes, if, I mean, who knows? Yes, the, yeah, the plan knows? is to have the Collegium Spinozanum, the fourth edition at this point in July 2000, uh, yeah, 2021. 20, yeah. uh, so that would be the ideal plan between the 6th and the 9th of July. But that was the plan. So now we know that our plans become very short, uh, have a very short span in front of them. So hopefully we will make it. And if not, probably people will have other things to worry about so they won't miss the collegium. But I hope that we can make the collegium, although hope, hope is a kind of sad effect. So it's not the best <laughs> effect to have. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's see if it, it, it seems to be that there's still a, a necessity for, uh, for Spinoza. I mean, uh, my experience is that sure. uh, people do, uh, do tune, uh, tune in to uh, these kind of events that uh, we do. We do also do a Spinoza circle, which is a reading circle at the end of the month, every month, uh, where we're actually just reading and discussing Spinoza first uh, primary materials mostly. Uh, and uh, we're having another Spinoza session in two weeks. Uh, hopefully by then we will have figured out what uh, is so wonky about our audio setup. I have no idea what it is, but we will be working on it. And that will be with uh, Torkil Tanim of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. So I hope uh, you'll all join us again in two weeks. And uh, also in two weeks on the 20th, I just remind you if you're in The Hague or around The Hague, apparently, well, keep up to date on it. Uh, we will be opening our doors at uh, Westenhaag and you'll actually be able to come and see the exhibitions uh, and see some of the context uh, because we are trying to bring together, trying to uh, look at, again at cultural uh, uh, institutions, contemporary art institutions as a, as a place to encounter the difficult uh, conditions that we're living uh, through today, bring people together and, and engage, in, in, uh, yeah, engage in worthwhile discussions together. So uh, it was really wonderful talking with you today, Andrea. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks, yes, everybody, thank for you. tuning in. Yes. And uh, we'll see you around. Thank you. All sure. the best. Cheers.